Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you want to find the love of God, you won't find it by continuing the war with your neighbor after he's declared both of you to be at peace. If you want to find the favor of our righteous God, you won't find it by humiliating the unrighteous sinners that surround you. No, if you want the love of God, you will find it in the place where God showed love to all the world, to you and to those whose sins have had the spotlight placed upon them. You'll find the love of God in the cross of Jesus Christ, where God pours out his mercy and forgiveness for you and everyone else who needs it. So here's the context for our Old Testament reading uh, for today. So if you remember your Bible history, uh, there's King David and King David's son Solomon is king for a while. And Solomon, uh, Solomon eventually departs from the faith and begins offering sacrifices for the false gods of his many foreign wives. So God says to Solomon that he is going to take the kingdom away from his son Rehoboam. So Rehoboam becomes king. There's a division. Uh, and you have the king of, kingdom of Israel in the north, which is essentially the rebel kingdom, and you have the kingdom of Judah in the south, which is where the descendants of David rule. Uh, and throughout the history of uh, this period, uh, for the most part, the kings of Israel are unfaithful. Uh, the kings of Judah, on the other hand, is a bit, little bit more uh, skewed towards uh, faithfulness, but for the most part, there's still a profound amount of unfaithful, ungodly kings. And in our text for today, Uh, we meet perhaps the most unfaithful of all of the kings of Judah, a king by the name of Ahaz. So Ahaz is a man who builds all kinds of altars for false gods, who encourages the worship of false gods, who even sacrifices his own children, burns them alive, uh, to a false god called Baal. And so out of anger, out of judgment, God decides that he is going to bring destruction to the armies of Judah on the battlefield as a sign that Judah has departed from his covenant. So so the kingdom of Israel in the north teams up with Syria and they go to war against Judah and in a specific battle Israel manages to destroy 120,000 of Judah's soldiers. There on that battlefield God uses Israel as a way of showing Judah that they need to repent of their sins. However, Uh, The armies of Israel see this great victory that that God has given them. They become filled with pride, uh, and and they go far too far, deciding that on top of this victory, they are going to go about enslaving 200,000 of the people of Judah, taking their their own relatives, these people who are fellow members of the the people of Abraham, and treating them the way that ancient barbarian type of people would frequently do, which is why it is that Many of them are hungry, many of them are shoeless, and many of them are naked. It's quite likely that the people of Israel remember a similar defeat that they themselves had faced before when God's judgment was upon them, and that they're now having this sort of joyous but yet hateful moment where they are looking at those who were deemed to be more righteous than they were and showing them who's boss now. So in this moment they meet a prophet who calls them to repent. This prophet Oded who essentially comes out to them and says, look, you guys have your own sins to repent of. God gave this judgment on the battlefield. That was where God poured out that judgment, but you have continued judging. You have continued a pouring out judgment that was not yours to pour out by taking these captives. You have your own sins to worry about. You're not more righteous than these people. And by parading their humiliation through the streets, by pointing and laughing at their nakedness, by rebuking them and despising them for the judgment of God that came upon them, you're actually bringing that judgment upon your own head. So let them go. Bring them back to their homes. Now, the armies of Israel, their reaction is rather extreme. But it really shouldn't surprise us. After all, this is just simply what it is that sinners love to do whenever we find that God has, allowed, has poured out his temporal judgment on those surrounding us. So if you remember these distinctions, this is an important distinction in theology, the difference between temporal punishment and eternal punishment. So temporal punishments are the punishments in this life. Uh, for example, losing your job uh, for doing something wrong at work, uh, being executed for committing murder, whereas eternal punishments obviously deal with condemnation. Uh, So here God has poured out his temporal punishment 
And Israel's response is to simply say, look, we're going to make ourselves more righteous by pointing, uh, and by pointing at the unrighteousness of those around us. Uh, this is the desire, this is always the desire of sinners, that we think we can somehow make ourselves more at peace with God by continuing the war after he's ended, by taking that judgment that God poured out on the battlefield and taking it outside the battlefield and continuing to address the nakedness and shame and humiliation, continuing to pour judgment upon those who were deemed to be sinners. This is just, with this reaction of Israel shouldn't surprise us because we see this in our world every single day. And every single time you turn on the news, what do we see? Here's this person who was caught in some sin, whose judgment was poured out upon him somehow, either through the court system, uh, either through uh, somehow his sin become, being made public. And so what are we now going to do? What does the TV want us to do? It wants us to pour out even more judgment upon this person, make the sin even more public, have all of us stand around and laugh and mock this person for their nakedness, for their brokenness, for their sinfulness, for the unrighteousness that surrounds them. Especially for those of you who are on social networking on the internet. I mean, you, this is all that the stuff it seems to function for sometimes. So you go on and it's just simply, this is the person we're mad at today. This is the person who did the terrible thing. This is the person whose sin was uncovered in some specific way where God allowed this, what this person did in the dark to come into the light. And now we're going to all make sure that everyone we know knows about this. We're going to spread this news even further. We're going to try and do everything we can to make sure that we can loot and pillage whatever wasn't already taken from this person. Whether we see if, we, if we can all gang up and get this person fired, if we can get him to lose his job, if we can take his friends away from him because what God put on the battlefield, the judgment that God, get, God, that God gave on the battlefield wasn't enough. It wasn't sufficient. We want to make ourselves more righteous by pouring on more judgment and piling on to the dog pile of scorn. This is the way the world works every single day. And quite frankly, I'm tired of it. Are you? Are you tired of this? When a, when a high-profile Christian gets caught up in some sin and the world does the exact same thing that the, nation, that the armies of Israel did, where they come out and they say, oh, look at you, Christian, you thought you were better than us. You thought you were holier than us. Now well, we've got your sin right in front of us. You've already, God's judgment has been poured out upon you, and we're going to take away even more from you what you already had. We're going to treat you in such a way where you'll just simply want to run off into the woods and never have another encounter with another human being again. This happens. And are you just simply tired of feeling this pull within you to just dive into that pile and to take part in that scorn and that rejection? When someone you know, perhaps someone you doesn't like, loses his job because of something he's done at work. So when God uses your boss to pour out judgment upon that man, you look at that and say, that's not enough. I want more judgment, more humiliation. I want to talk with my co-workers about this and make sure that everyone I know is familiar with what happened, that everyone I know sees this man's nakedness and his humiliation. Do you find yourself in these moments just unable to stop yourself from participating in taking away whatever is left from this person, whatever God left him? Are you tired of that? You should be. Look, when, when someone you don't like gets caught in a lie, are you tired of immediately wanting to parade his humiliation around in front of everyone you know through gossip? However this happens, do you find yourself in this moment where you just become part of the mob that wants to take away from someone whatever they have left? Well, the reality is that you should be tired of this. All of us should be. We should all be tired of this because that exhaustion that you feel is the voice of your conscience telling you the same thing that this prophet told the armies of Israel. When you feel just that guilt and just exhaustion over this, this is your conscience saying to you, look, this, you have your own sins to worry about. Do you really think that you're more righteous than these people that you're humiliating just because God didn't choose in this moment to allow the darkest works of your own heart to be made known. 
No, you have your own sins to worry about. God allowed the place for this judgment to be poured out, and that's it. The battle's over. The battle's finished. So let it go. Stop pouring on judgment where God has told you to be merciful. The, the, the book of James, chapter 1, says, The anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. So no matter how bad you get at the sins of this world that you see, that's not actually going to make you righteous. That's why we get so tired trying to make ourselves righteous in this way. So then what does produce the righteousness of God? What produces the righteousness that God requires? It's the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. It's His holy, perfect blood. What produces the righteousness of God is the Son of God taking the wrath that we all deserved into His grave and giving us His reward of eternal life in its place. If you want to know what it looks like for, God to, for how it is that God treats those upon whom judgment has been poured out on the battlefield, if you want to know how it is that Christ treats those who have lost the battle, who are lying there, who, who's, who have been, who's, whose nakedness has been uncovered for the world, you'll find the answer to that in, in two of our texts today. You'll find it in the Old Testament text for how these chiefs among the tribes of Ephraim respond to these people who have been taken captive. And you, of course, find it in the very similar language in our Gospel reading for today of how the Good Samaritan treats the man who's left naked and for dead at the side of the road. So here in this moment, from the cross, Christ looks out on us, and there he sees these people who warred against God. There he sees these people who have been bruised and bloodied and left for dead on account of the sins that they inflicted on themselves while trying to wage war against the God who made them. And out of his mercy, Christ looks at them with compassion. And he pours out his healing and his forgiveness. So, though, so to you, when you were naked on account of your sins, Christ came to you on the cross. And through the shedding of his blood, he covered you in the robe of his righteousness. He clothed your nakedness, gave you the right to stand before your God with your, humili with your humiliation covered. He covered your humiliation by taking the sins that caused it, by having those sins pierced into his hands and feet, by burying those sins in the tomb. When your body was broken apart, when you were festering with wounds because of your transgressions, Christ didn't pour more judgment upon you. He didn't call for the angels to point at you and laugh at your humiliation. Rather, in that moment, Christ opened up the wounds of his own flesh so that with his own wounds, you would be healed. When you were hungry, when you were without food from the cross, Christ gave you the perfect, pure, cleansing, purifying, healing, saving, restoring food of his own body and blood. When the enemies of God were hungry, Christ fed them with the very flesh and blood of God. And there, when you were needing safety, in that moment, Christ was the one who picked you up on his donkey and delivered you into this inn that we call the church. Delivered you into this house where he is the one who is caring for you, loving you, protecting you, feeding you with the word of his salvation that is poured out upon you every day so that every single week when you come to church, every time you hear the Word, you are once again clothed in that righteous robe. Once again, your wounds are bound up with the anointing oil of His forgiveness. Once again, you are fed with His righteous food, with His body and blood, with His salvation given for you when His body was broken for you upon the cross and when His blood poured out for you upon the cross. This is what Christ has done for you. And this is also what Jesus has done for those who in this moment are still on that temporary battlefield. So the man who got fired and lost his job because of his sins, Jesus doesn't condemn him. 
clothes him. The man who got busted for having an account on Ashley Madison. Jesus doesn't make sure that the entire world knows that this man's name was on the email list. Jesus promises to feed him with forgiveness. The liars, the cheats, the cruel people in this world whose sins have been exposed for the world to see. Jesus has covered them in the flood of his blood. Jesus has clothed their nakedness, bound up their wounds, fed them with his mercy, and given them the right, just as he gave you, to rest in the church as the forgiven children of God. That's what Jesus has done for them. So go and do likewise. Amen.